Let's just get our joints mobilized a little bit. Let's get our necks back and forth. And turn the head. And when you tilt the head, if you tilt the head and like make your jaw go up at the same time, you get a little bit extra stretch out of your neck. That's kind of neat. Kind of think like you're being hanged or something. <laughs> oh, shit. You feel that little mm -hmm. practice hanging? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Shoulder, make little circles with the shoulders. One direction and the other direction. Good. Wobbly action here. So you're like, let the arm swing and just stay loose. Let the shoulder roll forward and back a little bit. And it's hard. This is one of these. If you if you're letting your shoulder come up as you make circles, it's different than if you keep your shoulder down and make the circle. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And usually, for most of the stuff we do, we like our shoulders to stay down. Just reading a little bit. Now. Most of the critique I get when I go to the Daito thing. <laughs> Shoulders are up again now. <laughs> so I'm starting to learn to pay attention to keeping them settled down as I'm using them, which is unusual for me. It's usually they come up and you do stuff. They go up again. That's a Jerry Lewis thing. Yeah, if you just do the elbow. <laughs> and so. We do the behind one. My worst thing. Back here, one Stop. direction, and the other. Just got to go three or four times each. Hold on. Oh, up above the head. And again, if you reach up with the shoulders, different. Keep the shoulder down. We're going to circle. And it's coming, it's moving from here. It's not just the elbow. And then, so. There you go. Circle. Yeah. Circle. Well, it's different if you go up here and do it, you know. Here. And down here. Like an elephant bang on his trunk. The other way. Yeah, you'd like to engage it from the elbow, the wrist, hand. Elbow, wrist, hand. You can go different directions if you like. And again, I raise my shoulders up too high. Do that. Bam, bam, bam. There you go. So, up and down, down, and down, up and down, yeah, circles. Fingers. Circles. And your chest, you want to make your chest go forward and through your back, and your chest sort of like extending out through the breastbone and then compressing back so you feel your ribs collapse and you feel your ribs expand and collapse. You feel this circulated. And if you post your hips, you can also get some lateral action in the rib cage. You'll feel it right here and here. You can make that into a circle. But the hips want to be calm. So it's happening, yeah, it's a smaller range of motion. <laughs> you feel that little shifting that goes? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Now we're going to do our hips. 
And yeah, when you get out to an edge, mm, you want to kind of feel that long line out there. Mm. Pilates, one and two. Pilates, you lay on the ground and it's core stuff, honestly. Oh. It's built for dancers. I was referring to that movie where the guy was going to fight. The two guys were going to fight. Oh, and he's. I know Pilates. Pilates, one and two. I know Pilates, one and two. I can get on the ground and do crunches really good. That's right. Like the jokes. And feet and ankles. Rolling to the edges, fore and aft. <coughs> mm -hmm. You do a thing where you put the toes up on this and the heel on that, and then the toes on this and the heels on that. Posing. Cool, but you kind of like, yeah. Everybody's width is a little different. If I scooch in just a couple of inches, my heels start to come up. <laughs> and connective tissue take a good long damn while. That's right. long There's a video by a fellow that's called, you look it up, called Yin Yoga. If you're interested in stretching connective tissue, mm -hmm. the Yin Yoga people to go into a yoga hole that, you know, if you're in yoga class, you're going to be in that asana, in that posture for 20, 30 seconds sometimes, you know. Power yoga might be there a minute. They'll go into postures, and the postures aren't hard, but they are uh, held for, uh, God, it seemed like 15 minutes, some of them. Mm -hmm. They're there a long damn time. And the point is to, to work on connective tissue specifically. Oh, oh okay. But you, you're getting past just the muscle thing, and you're getting down to the bones and the, mm -hmm. and the uh, stretchy connective stuff, the fascial tissue, basically. Yes, okay. cool. He's talking about the. Hamstrings and quads. Well, the hamstrings are still in the muscle, right? Yeah. It's muscle and connective tissue both. So, yeah, if you go down here and go, I can't go any further, right. that may be muscle, but it's probably more likely to connect the tissue. Is good too. So, yeah, you just go here and hang. Hmm. And just hang for a while. And just breathe and relax. Another practice is like this we do on uh, Monday nights in the back, the, uh, the uh, Qigong exercises that uh, Louise has been doing with, from uh, Claire Johnson's group. They'll do these prolonged positional stretches like this. And she'll just get here and we'll just, you, know, you can shift from one leg to the other. You can move around a little bit just to keep yourself occupied, but basically you're here for many, many minutes. Periods of time, just letting it kind of do its thing. And if anything hurts, then you come out of it for a little while. But you stand in a room with everybody else bent over like this, so eventually you go back and do it some more because there's nothing else to do. So <laughs> or go have coffee or something. I've heard, heard several people talk about uh, 
stretching the. Mm -hmm. That was the most important thing. To keep. So it's a big deal. Yeah. It's a big deal for basic athletic continuation as you get older and older and older. It's one of the ranges of motion that gets shortened. And when it's too foreshortened, then it, once it gets too foreshortened, yes, you're in the shuffle thing. You're no longer walking normal. It's hard to have. To, it's hard to get into athletic response. When all you have is it. sometimes this is the athletic response, but <laughs> if that's all you got, ooh, then you're you're living in a very little narrow framework, and that that's pretty dangerous. You become very fragile. That's that's kind of loose. Right. He's, he's got some, he's some got flexibility got things and knee problems. Right. He's got some knee problems. From, well, his his old exercise regime when it was cold outside in the, in the Dakotas, he couldn't go out. And, Walk or run or anything, you just do this for an hour. <laughs> and surprise, surprise, his knees are kind of worn out now. You know, his knees don't, don't like that much anymore. I do that during the summertime up there because of mosquitoes. <laughs> Sit there, and up and down, and up and down, and up and down. <laughs> Several hundred reps, just see how many you can do. I can just see him doing that. It's weird. Yeah, right, right. And it's, uh, yeah, uh, uh, one of the famous. Old judo teachers at the Kodakon. That was his warm up. He'd come into the Kodakon apparently. And he'd just be there for 30 minutes. You know, sit, standing over the corner, bobbing up and down. My theme kind of has been that uh, our Aikido is judo. And I just like feedback. What does that mean to you now after a couple of days of fooling with judo and fooling with what we do? I'd like to hear what it. Uh, if you think about our Aikido from that perspective, what do you come up with? What's in your head about that? Our Aikido as Judo at arm length, and I did that with Gary Burlinger once. Mm -hmm. Tell me about him. He, um, he was having real trouble saying he just didn't understand Aikido at all, and, and he would sit there and try to, you know, do cranky things mm -hmm. with his arms, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Smash. Mm -hmm. right. No, go go out and do do do, do throws mm -hmm. up here. Mm -hmm. Of course, he can sit there and take. He can do hand throws. And just do hand throws yeah. like you do in judo, but do them way out here. Yeah. So and that was mm -hmm. pretty miraculous. When he when he put those two together, he was no longer trying to crank around in your arms. Yeah. And he was just take little. If you talked about it the other night about uh, uh, a scarf. A silk scarf, silk scarf, right? right. Technique. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what it felt like when he was throwing. Right. Right. I can believe that. Gary, if you don't know, he was like two generations before uh, Bob <laughs> from the same venue. Yeah. Cool. Okay. What is what is Aikido is judo to all you To me, tag your yeah. I don't have to think about it as transitioning anymore. I can just naturally throw one to the other. Mm -hmm. What I'll have. Uh, well, I can kind of keep moving now, even with the judo, I think, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, vice versa. So this, the ease of movement is the same for both of you. That's really cool. That's really cool. I like that. Ease of movement. Freedom of movement. Nice. A lot of the, the keto moves in the end ended up going right to what you said. Mm-hmm. That's true. You can basically take almost any end position and turn it into a throw. So if you're doing shamanate, he's walking up, and you're in his hand, you say, bam, and you all right, shamanate, I'm also in the perfect spot for coach. <laughs> so it's a nice thing. It's right there. You don't have to do anything different. You can miss your shamanate. So you get all tangled up with this guy, and your hand's back here. So wow, you could be right on top of him riding him down. In perfect space. Right? So yeah, there's there's opportunities like that damn near everywhere you look. Once you start looking. But if you never look, you don't get to see them. Or if you've never done enough judo to understand what the what the positional issues are, then yeah, you, you'll miss them too. Well, lightness like, came up. Lightness came up? With, uh, and I haven't really been able to do the judo before because of translating more to the and I think vice versa. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, it, when people train just in judo, 
they tend to get addicted to pressure in their hands. So they get a hold of a guy, I'm gonna get, Dale. They get their hands on him, your hands are on me, and we automatically have a certain amount of tension. So I got, I don't know, 10 pounds in this hand and five, six pounds in this hand or 20 or whatever the hell it is, and he's got that in me too. And we have this sort of default setting of pressure. I'm pushing on him, he's pushing on me, I'm pulling on him, he's pulling on me, we got this, this heaviness out here. And it's real different to walk up and just think, I'm doing Aikido, I'm putting my hands on him, but I don't want him to feel a damn thing. You know? And he's doing pretty light, but he's pushing down on his side right still. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a whole different feel. And if you develop that touch and you go out in the world and say, I do a little judo and you say, ah, get your grips and put your hands on people who know better, they go, whoa, this is different judo than I'm used to, just by the feel of it. Because once you've committed X amount of pressure, once, you, once you're in this range, and this is just what's normal to you, right? And it's turning into this, you feel the difference? Yeah, <laughs> if you still have pressure on me, I got a bunch of information and you don't have much, right? And you get to do stuff that they don't get to do. Sort of like you get free moves. Really, really cool. So the lightness, yeah. Well, I don't know if I've come up with a universal thing. I've seen distinctions in how to apply in uh, our Aikido. Mm -hmm. uh, I can say both that we, in our Aikido, we both attack or take uh, advantage of the perpetual off balance of your partner. Uh, the applications are, uh, I, I look at them as a little bit different and if I could have this foot forward, uh, in judo we want to take that predominantly more or if he has a grab on me I want to go around I want to go around if you stiff on around that point. It's a neutral point of around rotation point. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, right. I don't I don't see much in judo where you've got this and you're going around that point. Not not fighting that force. But right. Around we get so bogged down in gripping yes. that that gets blurred. Right. The neutral point of rotation it, it, we start having it's, it's largely approached intuitively in judo. Right. Whereas when it's out here and it's obvious, yes. point of rotation, neutral point, leave that right there, turn everything around it, and wow, look what you got. But if I try to move that point, it becomes a non-neutral point. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's what's going on a lot in judo. Right. When these hands get pressure and you get a hold of each other's keys, and that's why smart guys tell you, get your damn hands out of the deal. Or what Bob was saying. Don't use your hands to move them at all. Yeah. Make your connection point. If you want to use your hands, use it to move you. The point becomes a neutral place, like where you're doing a push-up off of. The ground ain't moving. You can push off of that. You know? It becomes a neutral point of rotation, and everything goes around it. Point of rotation also is where the center between the two bodies is. Yes. And so that becomes the what you're having to intuit between us. You make contact. He's got a center of gravity, I've got a center of gravity. We're two independent features. We make contact, and now there's a center of gravity that has to do with uh, the two bodies and their linkage. So we're like two ends of a barbell with a heavy weight on one side and a lighter weight on the other side, but it's a bar in between. And you drop that thing through space, and it will have a center of gravity on that bar in between. If it's a big, massive weight and a smaller weight, well, it'll be over here toward the massive first side. But basically, whenever two bodies or more bodies are clumped together, you get this common shared center of gravity thing. That becomes an intuitive point of rotation of who's controlling that point and who's using that to the advantage of the other side. And the weight necessarily doesn't matter too much. If I'm dumb about it and he's smart about it, the size will be negligible. Yep. I completely agree with that. I think. Uh Aikido teaches you more of an understanding of that than I think, like you said, Judo, maybe you kind of develop an intuitional... I think most idea. people wind up with it coming intuitively yeah. in Judo. But yeah. I think having an understanding of that, because I've first-hand experience in this, and, and right. people that have no... they don't study the science of that, mm -hmm. you know, like Aikido does more, in my opinion, they have this confused kind of sensation whenever you get to that angle, that, that 
that more Aikido style angle. And well, we're really works. great at recognizing it, like we're holding hands and we're, we're rotating around this center point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what's the centrifugal feeling like? We're mm -hmm. really great at recognizing that sort yeah. of thing in this very flat plane. What judo gets very great at intuiting is when the centers are, mm -hmm. are in the vertical plane. Mm -hmm. And one center is coming up and displacing from underneath. The other center is rolling over the top. And you have this kind of inversion line, right? That's, that's because it's much closer. So if Brian gets his center right in the place, just a little, there it is, right there. His center is starting to roll mm -hmm. under my center at that point where our joint centers are having that thing. Right. And suddenly he's like a ball rolling under another ball and it's going over the top. And you're getting these rotational things that are happening in the vertical plane. And that's where they shine more typically. That intuitive stuff. Close up. Yeah. What else? How is our Aikido Judo? Ain't no wrong answer so far. Well, what I feel in playing with Judo for the last few months, mm -hmm. primarily with one individual, but anyway, mm -hmm. uh, is the <coughs> making of what I perceive as off balance has happened. Mm -hmm. At the in initiating, mm -hmm. beginning, beginning the engagement with a little bit of a, a little touch, a little bit of a something going on, mm -hmm. a, bit of a, mm -hmm. a roll backwards on the shoulder and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That's the thing about judo that feels the most like a keto to me. Of course, it's exactly the opposite of the question being asked, but nonetheless, that's right. the thing about the judo that seems, seems the most cool. most like keto like to me is that there are these light little, little touches that, that you can provoke touching. reactions with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if you, if you play around a, a bit, you get instructions that have to do with standing straight up mm -hmm. and knocking the person over, mm -hmm. not knocking you over to do a hip, right. hip throw, <laughs> but knocking the person over to do a hip throw. Cool. Uh, and I don't know, yeah, that seems to be inconsistent in, in, mm -hmm. in how it's perceived. Because sometimes it's this, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's this. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, I, I, I see some... Uh, some relationship in, mm -hmm. in the cool. degree to which we're preloading and or during the engagement, mm -hmm. causing ankles to shift, weight to shift on top of, yeah. of some place. Yeah, uh, and it's interesting that it's smaller units maybe collapse of yeah. change too. Yeah. That that because judo is taking place in a in a tight framework because we're close to each other mm -hmm. and it's happening within a half step, then yeah, the change can be instead of a posture break. Pretty yeah. obvious. The whole spine engaged and the hips. It's a, you know, the heel. The heel is rolled over. You know, or man, you got a little tilt in the shoulders or something. It's relatively smaller affect. What kind of made me think about it was in the Daito we thing that we saw last March. Mm -hmm. You had <laughs> what I perceived of at the time as an answer to very very close combat, small close combat, mm -hmm. and where you did small things in here. Mm -hmm. Those were real tight. And I'm actually, to some extent, seeing that as very, very similar to what certain judo people are doing. Yeah. yeah. Very, very, very similar to what And it's, it's interesting people. because I think that also plays into the point that uh, certain judo people who have a background in a um, system of Aikido right. <laughs> that has been influential in these particular ways right. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's there's some crossover that goes both ways. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of interesting. Oh. So if you take the action, we do this this kind of action a lot for different things. Mm -hmm. And then the keto, when you start out, it's a really big action. Mm -hmm. And you want to make it a little smaller. Mm -hmm. And when I get to judo, it's I've got more surface area. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm feeling more surface area with the other person, so it's uh, I can feel what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I if you're play. using your hands like feelers, and not can, like right, braggers. Right, right. You're using your hands as feelers, and you can you can work on making that little that circle smaller and smaller and smaller, so that when you get back out into mm -hmm. a you know sure. a, a longer mine, uh -huh. you can feel right. oh I can still do that. I don't have to go like this all the sure, time. Sure, I can sure. do this can if I want to. A little tiny. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Very good. I can make that work. Cool, 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 cool. I love it. I'm a little bit convinced if you wanted to teach an Aiki person mm -hmm. judo, you shouldn't have the grips. Probably not. I'm, I'm pretty much convinced grips, that grips are a dumb idea. Are very judo piercing. 
You know, that's the, <laughs> that's the insanity of competitive judo, that they make you get up there and get into those grips. And you were penalized. Yeah. You're forced to be up there. If you're avoiding grip, grip, then you you are losing. Really? Then you lose. Really? Yeah, they're, 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 you're being too defensive. That's stupid. Right. Avoiding grip. But yeah, I, I I I really think as we come into position together, you're placing your hands on the guy, and you're just as good to be just in contact with his body. Mm -hmm. And if you want to have pulling action, then it's a it's like a sloth. It's like a hook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you want. Just to have sensitivity, it's just hand out there and sensitive. And you have it so that the wrist can go like this easy, so if he jumps in hard and fast and blam, that you have a, a mechanism that will collapse to a finite space. So you have a type of individual arm that can engage automatically without having to pull it in. But that you're also not busy trying to shove him with it. You're not trying to use it as a driver. It's still that the hands are mainly out there as antenna to read energy and to deliver little kind of things <laughs> at certain specified moments, they can still be kind of useful for little tiny effects, but you're not looking for it to make big giant effects. You're not looking for the big giant pulls and pushes. That's obvious from the way Bob was talking that he was feeling into. He knew exactly where his center was, the other person. You put your hand on them and you can tell where the feet are. Where the joints are. And if you put your hand on them and it's just like a hazy thing out there, then you don't have enough, you don't have the, the pressure gradient correct. And when you get to enough pressure, just get a partner, put the hand on them. And if you're just touching at the skin, it's hard to tell where different parts of his body are intuitively. Mm -hmm. But as, it, as a certain gradient comes up, you, you can find it. It's you know where his feet are. You know where his back foot is. You know where his back hand is. If he bends his elbow on his far side, you'll feel it happen. But if, if you're too light or too heavy, if I'm dragging like this and he makes that, it, I've, I've made so much noise in my informational system that it's drowning out the signal coming to you. So yeah, the tactile signal is a big deal. And the amount of pressure you can afford to have in your hands, if they're out there like the Incredible Hulk, you can have some power in your hands and still the signal is going to be overwhelming enough you'll get it. But if they are out there have any kind of subtlety at all, man, you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss it. Because the, the kind of shifts you go to, we start with shifts like this, right? Or an Aikido a shift like this with the whole body moving. But over time in Judo, you want to catch shifts like that. So you start with a foot sweep, right? You've got the side to side thing, catching the feet. And then the foot sweep gets smaller. And then it gets smaller. It's just here. And now what Bob's saying, they can put their feet together and they'll move it all. <laughs> Do it again from there. So add it to the repertoire. But you can work from this wide range of saying, well, what's your maximum width that you can still pull your foot together from? And that'd be a pretty catastrophic jump up in the air kind of body rise, right? <laughs> I kind of have to jump to do it. I kick myself to here. And do a foot sweep from that. It'd be Pretty easy. And in fact, when people have trouble learning double foot sweep, one of the things we used to tell them is make big swoopy steps together so that you're accentuating and exaggerating body drop and body rise. It makes it real easy to see it in the other person. And you do it together and you're dancing around with these big swoopy steps and then, wow, you can make them go up in the air real easy. But you don't stay there. You don't do swoopy steps for the rest of your life. Once that's happening, you start making reasonable size steps and get where you can do the same thing from that and then less reasonable size steps same thing from that to just shifting weight most people never get to just shifting weight they still need the foot to scooch a little but just shifting weights a big deal or as soon as you're in contact with them and they put their weight on this foot you can take that foot it's going to be deal. boom until it's just mm, just a flinch and you say, damn, it's fast, it's a fast throw. And it is a fast throw because you're not dealing with this time frame anymore. You're dealing with this time frame. Just that little turn. So what you're reacting to gets more refined, tighter and tighter and tighter. Amanda, you haven't said anything. Hmm. How is our Aikido Judo? Uh, and you can disagree if you don't think it's Judo. I think it's Aikido. 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 I think it
honestly do not know. I mean, I okay. see a lot of similarities in basically what everyone else has said. Mm -hmm. but I've noticed myself. Cool. I honestly don't know too much more judo than either, so I, I, right. I don't think I know everything. Me neither. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. So, yeah. We've heard the expression that Tomiki look at this as judo at a distance, and we think of this as the Aikido at a closer distance. Mm -hmm. And it's also interestingly the range, as Dale brought up, where Daito is being thought of in fighting, where elbows and knees and swords and short knives are in play. And that, that is a distinction where we start looking at what the, what the big differences are. The, the, but before I go to that, the, the similarity, I think, in our particular type of Aikido versus Aikido at large, from all the rest of the Aikido in the universe I've seen, is that we have this thing, well, like the walk. We're going to do the walk. Just stand where you are, and let's just do the walk. Ichi, ni, sa, shi, go, roku, ichi, hachi. One of the things that's really unique and amazing about that is we all did it together. We've synchronized something, and what we've synchronized is the timing of steps. And by synchronizing timing of steps, we are synchronizing rise and fall. And when we do releases, we say, okay, we're going to do releases, we try to time, time, time the steps. So if his feet hit, my feet hit, bodies are sinking and rising. We reinforce to a remarkable degree for an Aikido system the synchronization of the wave function, the sine wave of the center of gravity going up in the air and going down, and going up in the air and going down. That is directly related to the, to the foundational system from judo, which is why when Bob has the drum out, boom, 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 he's trying to get everybody to synchronize feet so that you can start from this rhythmic pattern of rise and fall, and you'll be catching your actions within the framework of this, this very smooth frame. It comes from Kito Ruji. It's, it's very much typified by that. It's not saying that there's not footwork in the rest of the Aikido world. It's just that they, they don't do it the same. <laughs> they, don't, they don't conceptualize it within the framework of that rise and fall being the dominant paradigmatic thing that they're doing. They're much more interested in making wide-legged gestures with it and making positional things out of it and how are the feet in relation to each other. It's more stance-oriented. They call it hanmi. They do a bunch of hanmi work. Okay? And they do some exercises where this is happening. This is happening. Or rowing is happening. It's happening within short frameworks. It's happening with these exaggerated positional things. And it's not in relation to the other person. It is when they do a technique with it, but it's not, they don't have something like releases where we're just synchronizing rise and fall in relation to the other person on the turn, which isn't necessarily built around a technique per se. It can be a lot of techniques, right? Sort of a universal device of gluing people together, but it's not, um, uh, 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 it's not collapsed down to a function of every time you do this release, you're always hitting in the face, for instance. And there are systems that do that. Ch uh, Chuck Caldwell, the whole system of eight releases, he basically said, at the end of every release, hit it in the face. That's a pretty good self-defense tactic. If you haven't ever done that, now we do number two. And hit him in the face. <laughs> you just show manate at the end of everything. If you do show manate at the end of everything, well, then you can start doing wrist things and elbow things at the end of everything, too. So it was a beginning towards doing that, but people would then sometimes think that that was the release. But the release actually ended at the point that you got behind the arm and stayed in motion with them in a rise and fall pattern. But they say, well, what's the end of it? Well, there is no end. <laughs> you just do that rise and fall pattern together for a while until you decide to go to the next one. Because it's not about an ending, it's about a relationship and staying in that... Kind of like a beginning with an infinite symbol. And, and yeah, you could, you could as long as you can keep walking together and stay in that pattern, the release goes on and on and on and on. And that's, that's part of the problem, is the language that got tacked onto it. The release has something to do with 
I want to get that away from me. I want to break the contact. I want to take that off. Get that away from me. You know? And then uh, releases are about, I want to join this. I want to hang with this. Well, the releases were not called releases. Yes, that's right. They were by the Japanese. Sort of dosa. Yeah. Which originally just paired exercise. Oh, paired and exercise. Then, and then later it's kazushi. Kazushi. So yeah. You see forms of kazushi. Or where the release were. Right? <coughs> I don't know either. I'm not sure where. Who, they don't who call put that together. In, in England. When, uh, no. And when, uh, that. when uh, Chuck Clark branched off to do his thing, he changed that name almost okay. immediately to uh, Masubi Renshu. Okay. Which is just, I just want to have a sense of connection. Right. That sticks to him. It's practice of the sticky thing. Oh, right. Practice of the sticky thing. Do the sticky thing to the death. You just want the sticky thing that they can't quite get loose of. Right? But the paired up and down is very, very important. Right. I think so too. Because that's how we're entraining our centers to the other person's center. So that you reflexively over and over again, whether we're at a distance, like in the walk, and you're not connected, but you're, you're both Depending on where you're standing in the room, you have to do it entirely peripherally, or you might have to do it just from sound, if you're way up front. But being in the back of the room, seeing the whole damn thing move together, and you're, or you're in the middle, which has, no matter where you're looking, you're getting reinforcement. So, when we get the white belts, we put them in the middle, they get the most signal from all angles. And then over time, it doesn't matter where you are. Over time, we all close our eyes, close your eyes, spin around in a circle, stop wherever you are, and do the walk from right there. Each. Knee. <laughs> she. Go. Roll. And we're still synchronized. And we're still synchronized. Mm -hmm. From random ass angles. <laughs> That's funny to see. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's very, it's very odd because you just... But you're still picking up plenty of signal to synchronize with this wave pattern. A little bit sneakier. Mm -hmm. If you pay attention to your peripheral vision while you're doing the walk. Mm -hmm. You're not just synchronizing your up and down. Mm -hmm. You're also synchronizing this. And that's right. That. That's right. You're synchronizing a whole, the whole bunch of body of things that are being synchronized. That's right. And you'd like it watch. to all get into one thing. Exactly. Kind of mirror around you. You're learning to mirror responses mirror going on around you. Precisely. And it does. But Precisely. the walk, even if it starts haphazard. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's a bit of genius. Mr. Tomiki's genius. That, that's a bit of his contribution to the universe that didn't exist in the Aikido world exactly. There were other people like Shiota that had very short forms, but they didn't do it as a big clump like we do. They do it in a line. Everybody's in a line together and they're all coming to this pose together. They're coming to this pose together. They're coming to this pose together. And we're all lined up like military guys, sort of. I can see the disadvantage of that. And it was, yeah, and it's very, uh, we're all here, we all go like this, we all go like that together. And it's uh, uh, very limited forms of the same thing, but you don't see this entire movement spectrum and this entire picking it up from all angles thing and this whole synchronization and mirroring function, which is really a similar comment, uh, comment about the Aido Kata, that, that when you're doing the Aido Kata, part of the intent mm -hmm. is to be mirroring the room together. Everybody together. He's not actually supposed to be a bunch of separate people doing the separate act of title. You're supposed to be the entire We're room Americans. We're a bunch of individualists. We individualists. We're out here doing the hurricane on our own, oh, right? Oh, five, seven, <laughs> you all seen the hurricane? You haven't seen the hurricane yet. Uh, yeah, I I get to, yeah. You need to look it up on the video if you haven't seen the hurricane. You seen the hurricane? Oh, I'm not seen the hurricane. I'm not sure. Spoke. Okay, Ameridote. Oh, yes. You go on yes. YouTube, yes. you look up, enter the dojo, Ameridote. Find the hurricane, the most deadly martial art, <laughs> oh, the perfect American martial art technique, Ameridote. Because it's completely random fucking ass. random ass individual, <laughs> <laughs> but they're just doing their own fucking Rex crazy shit. That's right, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> it is really funny. It is really funny. Cool. I think it's great fun. <laughs> but yeah, the enter the dojo, Ameridote. Spelled just like it sounds, Ameridote. So, yeah, we have this individualism thing. Japanese have a Confucian thing. We're all in one boat. We're all in one boat and we're trying to get over there. So we all got to row together. And almost anything you do with the different parts of Asian culture, there's very little, there's very little space in cultural 
world over there in China or Japan that I can tell, where it's go do your own thing. You see, you see some oddballs that go do their own thing, but they're very rare. They're, they're, they're outliers. The, the big part of the bell curve is not individualism. The big part of the bell curve is we're all in this together. And we're, if we're going to all go run, then the, the, well, that's the classic thing. We're all going out for a run, and the strongest runner ends up carrying the weakest runner across the line. Because everybody's got to get across the line. There's no strongest runner wins and gets out ahead of the pack. No, no, the, 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 the big dude actually winds up having to have, have to carry the people who can't make it across the line. I so, mean, to Beijing, it says that those who didn't meet the cultural norms mm -hmm. were kind of left off the side. And They're supposed to go out in the mountains and live in a cave. Yes, yeah. those, those people. It's the Taoist thing. Didn't, did not right. It. right. If, they, if you if right, you, you're you're if isolated. You're healthy, if you were you're isolated, or, yeah. right, you were put off the side, and people would ignore you. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, uh, you're, you're not participating in rowing the boat. We all got to row the damn boat. Yeah. Right. Exactly. There's no I in me. Yeah. I already did a study with yeah. Japanese and American people. Mm -hmm. and showed them a picture of like a, like a city, mm -hmm. a whole bunch of people, like a family. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they showed the picture to the Americans, like they would pick out like different things about different people. Mm -hmm. And then when they showed this to Japanese, they would pick out one thing that was across the board across for everybody. The, the thing that unified that, them all. Yeah, right. and they said Japanese people don't look at people as individuals. As the individuals. It's parts of one bigger whole. And I think part of that, we all get in the room and you're all supposed to end at the same time thing, comes out of that Confucian thing, but I think it has an active internalization purpose. When we do it enough, you wind up, I would suspect if you get a bunch of, of, choreo, uh, of dancing people, they do a lot of choreography, they've developed the same internalized sense. It's just that we start building it in reaction to dance with the guy to knock him down. So we're really doing a dance thing. And we're doing a spontaneous dance thing so that we're not doing a dance that's choreographed ahead of time. We have to make it up as we go along so it's sort of like jazz, and that's pretty wild. So we're doing this improvisational dance thing that is also not about just dancing, but also at some point we'd like the other person flat. Oh, or they'd like us flat. <laughs> they'd like to make us involuntarily flat. So it's like very clumsy dancing in that respect, or very precise, not clumsy. Well, it's hard to describe. And that's what makes it, it really, really, really works describe. if you're literally dancing. Yeah, you if you're really dancing Katie with Katie and I will dance. You go to the and dance club and throw each other around. Start doing a keto. Oh, Ooh, oops. Can we start doing that again? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'll clear a damn dance floor between the two of them. <laughs> Now they pull out the knives. Someone ends up like that in the middle of the dance. Yeah, right? yes, oops, oops, we're going to that again. We should, we should, we should just like inform this. again. Yes, but I can easily see that. What were you going to say? I was going to say jazz makes my brain hurt. Jazz? Well, right? there's cool jazz and there's hot jazz. I like cool jazz. Myself. I don't know the difference, but I know that. Hot's the real fast. <laughs> yeah, that makes my brain hurt. Yeah, it makes mine hurt too. I literally fled Starbucks one day. Run away I from the hot jazz. I couldn't right. think. I was like. Cool jazz is the do 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 Yeah, my and the It has a whole different feel. It has a different rhythm. I didn't know there was a difference. Yeah, you want to go find cool jazz. Right, because right. we do cool jazz, man. Yeah. I may try that. Yeah. I love jazz. <laughs> jazz is awesome. Jazz has got a tempo for every time you 